So should we just wait long to know the grand plan? Sounds good to me. Any questions about this? Does it make sense to everybody? All right, and like I said, I was uh, impressed that a lot of you have made some good progress on this radical mechanism. That's not an easy mechanism. Uh, but if you don't have this mechanism down yet, um, you want to keep practicing it. A key thing to remember, you can only deal with HBr. That, yeah, that's an important thing. This reaction wouldn't work with HBr or HCl, but you're right, with per the peroxide reaction only works with HBr. Right, so we might as well do 33 part A. So 33 part A is asking what would happen if we treated one hexene with aqueous sulfuric acid. And then they have some other things too. So that, that, this is actually a very good problem, so let's go through that. Because we assumed that like, first you would do the H2SO4 and you get a proton from that, but then would you use water after because it's aqueous? Yeah. That sounds good. All right, so we're still sticking with the one hexene, but now we want to treat it with aqueous sulfuric acid. So let's definitely go through the whole mechanism for this. This is an important mechanism. Looks like some of you are familiar with this reaction, and some are not yet, so maybe we can go through this together now. Now, the first thing that happens here, it should be pretty clear, one thing which, that should jump out of this is we've got a strong acid. And we talked about uh, some weeks ago that if you have a strong acid, you have to start by having the acid give its proton to somebody. A strong acid has to start by giving its proton to somebody. And who would be a good person to put at the tail of the arrow to receive the proton? Well, we've been saying that carbon-carbon double bonds are good to put at tails of arrows. So this is a reasonable uh, electron-pushing arrow here. By the way, you should learn and memorize the structure of sulfuric acid, because you can't really draw the electron-pushing arrows correctly unless you know this structure. For example, it's not the sulfur that should be at the head of this arrow, but this oxygen. So you should want to make a flashcard and memorize the structure of sulfuric acid so you can show it in mechanisms, because it's going to be important in a few mechanisms now. Now, now we have the choice. When the hydrogen adds, we can end up with the carbocation on the left-hand carbon or the right-hand carbon. But why is it better to put it on the right-hand carbon? Stabilize the carbocation. Stabilize the carbocation. And this is the theme that we keep coming across. We want to form the more stabilized carbocation. So we put this here. Now, the other product of this step would be this anion, which we now call sulfate. The conjugate base of sulfuric acid is sulfate. And again, it's best to draw out that whole, mecha uh, that whole mechanism here. Um, and so, oh, now, it should be pretty clear who's going to go at the head of our next electron pushing arrow. Who's going to go at the head of the next electron pushing arrow? The carbocation. Right, remember that we said the head. Oh. Well, the head should be 
the carbocation. But who could go at the tail? Well, theoretically, there seem like two candidates for the tail. What would be, seems it's like? Two O because it's the same world. Good. Now, there's actually a deeper reason than that as well. Now, some people might think that we should put this oxygen at the tail. You're going to need that later to, pro to get it back to protonate it with the H of the OH2. That's true. That's true. And there's even another reason why we should not put it. The most important reason is sulfate is not nucleophilic. And we just need to basically memorize that. Sulfate is not a nucleophile. Sulfate will never act like a nucleophile, so it cannot join this carbocation here. It's not too hard to explain why that is. Even though this oxygen has a negative charge, this negative charge is not really all that reactive because it's stabilized by resonance. There's another resonance form where the negative charge is on this oxygen, and another resonance form where the negative charge is on this oxygen. So this is not actually a very nucleophilic, uh, or in fact, we would treat this as non-nucleophilic. We basically need to memorize that. We should memorize that sulfate is not a nucleophile. Well, then the only nucleophile around would be this neutral oxygen. We know that neutral oxygen is not a great nucleophile, but it's good enough for attacking a carbocation. This is like the second step of an SN1 now. So now the water will come in and attack. So the most important reason not to use the sulfate as the nucleophile is because we just memorized that sulfates are never nucleophiles. Sulfates don't act like nucleophiles. Now when the water joins, is it forming a carbocat, uh, sorry, is it forming a stereocenter? Um, yes. yes. Which means we get two products because we're attacking something trigonal planar. So to be totally accurate, we need to draw the two products at this point because this is where we get the two products. Don't forget to put the charges in. The oxygens now have positive charges. So that gives us these two products over here. And what would happen now? Then the sulfate will We'll remove a proton. We know what happens if you do the main reaction and you still have a charge. Well, if you do the main reaction and you still have a charge, you try to get rid of a proton or gain a proton to get rid of that charge. Here, now we can use the sulfate because Although we're never going to use the sulfate as a nucleophile, it's okay to use it as a base in this step. At least it's conventional to use the base. I actually think it would be fine if you used another water molecule to take off the protons here. In fact, it might be more accurate to use a, another water molecule since the water is the solvent here. But it's still conventional to use the sulfate, so I'll show it that way. And it wouldn't also be because it's 50%, so you can use either. I'm sorry, 50%? It says it's 50%. Oh, does it? I don't see that. Oh, sorry. That's right. In fact, I think that this way probably would probably put in catalytic amounts of this. So there's probably far more water than sulfuric acid here. But anyway, it's conventional that we can use the sulfate here to deprotonate the positive oxygen. Although I think it would, it would be fine to use the water and in some ways more accurate, but most people would use the sulfate here. Okay. this gives us these two products. This is a, a very important reaction. So if you have difficulty with this, you definitely want to highlight it and come back and practice it again. This is certainly something that you'll need to use on the exam. So let's review the key portions here. First of all, you need to memorize the structure of sulfuric acid so you can draw its structure. Don't use sulfate as a nucleophile. In fact, we already talked about this again Remember, this is why we can use sulfuric acid and heat to get an E1 with no competition from SN1. If you go back to your SN2 handout, I think we talked about this last time, perhaps. Remember, there's one column where you get just E1, and that's when you use sulfuric acid and heat. And that is the column that's labeled no nucleophile, because sulfuric acid and sulfate are not nucleophiles. So you don't need to worry about competition from SN1. Well, here we're not doing SN1 or E1. We're doing an addition reaction. But the same principle applies. This is not a nucleophile. Uh, then the water comes in. We washed out for the stereo center over here. Now, there's an important name for this reaction. This is called hydration. And there's two good reasons why we would call this hydration. One good reason to call it hydration is that water attacked. Another good reason, though, is what are the two things that ended up adding to the double bond? 
If you think about the two things that added up ending to a double bond, we added a hydrogen to one end of the double bond, and we added the OH to the other end, and those are the elements of water. So that's another good reason to call this hydration, because ultimately we ended up adding the elements of water. 